Frank Endicott and Gerald Ryan actually said, what is the name of this team? You know, you call them New Zealand Women's Rugby League, Christine, but what is their name? And I said, well, I suppose they're the Kiwi woman. And uh, Gerald Ryan said, well, what about Kiwi Ferns? I said, that's it. We had to be real ambassadors of the game. We had to really portray a good perception of Women's Rugby League because when a whole lot of us came into it, there weren't very good perceptions of the game. Women's Rugby League, why would you want to play that? Only, you know, there, there was a certain picture, you know, you had to be big, you had to be butch to play. Our team in our first year, our club team, kind of broke all those stereotypes. Uh, Frank brought the Kiwi men to Carlow Park to watch the Kiwi Ferns play Great Britain. And I think that was the first time our Kiwi men had ever watched our women play the game. And he said to me, if that number six had balls, I'd have her in my team tomorrow. There was still probably a little bit of doubt amongst some as to whether women should play the game. But I think what it did is it gave us an opportunity to demonstrate how we could play the game. And the style of game that we play is quite exciting. And we tend to move the ball a little bit more um, than potentially the men's game, probably not quite as technical, but we do, we do tend to have that confidence in each other and throw the ball around. So from a spectator's point of view, the game's quite exciting. And I think people were pleasantly surprised at how well we did play the game. It was a full-time job. Back in the 1990s, there was no funding. You know, you couldn't just write an application and apply for some funding to go on a trip. It just wasn't there at that time. So we came up with this idea, OK, we'll do these raffles. I think first prize was $500, because that's all you're allowed to do. We had a chap that came from another very strong rugby league family, the Thompsons, and we called his name was Sweet As. He used to go all around New Zealand selling these tickets for us, and I have to say, that if it wasn't for Sweet As, New Zealand Women's Rugby League would not have survived. There was so much work we had to do, extra work that the men didn't have to do. Um, and I'm talking about finances, um, I'm talking about what it is to be a female athlete and have responsibilities at home. It was a battle to become affiliated, it was a battle to get a constitution, and I thought, no, I'm determined. I have to get in their boots and all and fight for these girls because here they, here they are out there playing a top grade, a fabulous display of women's rugby league and you men don't want to support them? And that's what people don't know. Even girls who are coming into the sport now, since 2013 when, when the Jillaroos won that World Cup, and um, if you look at the years, it's really only really been a short reign but the exposure has really um, given, highlighted how well they are, and we've kind of forgotten about our history um, as the Kiwi Ferns. It's shown the rivals stuff that we got for the Men's World Cup. Great, great turnout tonight. Good kick downfield, Frank's there with Gilmore, and that's the final whistle. All I can say, Mick on an end note, is what a fantastic advert for the game that was. It was sensational. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. And um, I'm certainly converted to watching more women's rugby league. Congratulations to uh, the New Zealand fans. They've been excellent throughout the competition. They've played the match. they played the game in tremendous spirit. They've handled themselves well. They've been a credit, a credit to New Zealand. Our coach pretty much did everything. We had a booklet. Um, for the World Cup that had everything on there, our moves, our details, hydration, food, our training program, everything, and they put that all together. So it was less people in management doing a whole lot of work, and now you have specific people um, doing sp specific roles. But I just really don't think that the girls realise that that's evolved from having minimal staff and being a, really the player, we had to drive everything. So in 98, having played both teams and been very successful and winning all our matches, we were classed as the unofficial world champions. So going to the World Cup in 2000 for the first women's ever World Rugby League World Cup 
and winning it was one of those things that it really sealed sealed the deal in that we were the official world champions. And I think once again we kind of, it, it was cementing the sport for women and sort of stating that, hey, you know, we're really um, serious about this and we love the game and we're not going away. Honestly, when we went to that World Cup, I just knew that we'd come off um, winning. I, I, I absolutely knew everyone had done everything they could. Um, everyone knew their job, everyone was ready, everyone was prepared, and we weren't going to leave that field losers. We weren't arrogant about it, but we just had this real confidence about us. Like, man, if they want to beat us today, they've got to bring their A game because we were really ready. And um, I think that started from 2000, that 2000 World Cup. They just were passionate about the game of women's rugby league. They used to fight hard to get into that team because by this time we had some great players. And um, when you look back, I think it was just the display of what they produced on the field made us women more determined to support and make sure that we got the money to make things happen. So we got named, was it we got named in, in June and, yeah, but, June, yeah, June, yeah, June yeah. yeah, and then we only had a month, no, two no. weeks, or oh, two weeks, yeah, two, two weeks. weeks, two weeks to sell raffle books yeah. to come up with $2,000 yeah. each, and that's, so if you and didn't that's, sell yeah. your raffle tickets, you're supposed to pay the balance, so basically yeah. everyone paid $2,000, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but you yeah. know what that did though, it actually brought in our whole community into what um, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 so they kind of yeah. knew, even yeah. The, yeah. by donating that small amount of money, mm -hmm. that they were yeah. supporting, um, and when we played, they were with us. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, they made us great. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. My, my boots fell apart at the Nationals, so I had to sell my vacuum to get in public here. <laughs> <laughs> we started in Sydney, um, then we went to Canberra, yeah. we, yeah, well, we, got, up we got straight off the... We got straight off the plane onto a bus, got changed and onto the field. And onto the field. Yeah. 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 Like ten, so we played the day, the day that we arrived. Yeah. Yeah, ten, <laughs> and we got some, some kicking training from Darren yeah. Higgins. Yeah. 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 That's right. So um, it was you, me and, yeah. uh, and Savannah. Savannah. Yeah. 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 Going to the Canberra Raiders and um, yeah. just meeting the guys like Laurie yeah, Bailey cool. and, and, and Ricky Australian and, and Mel Menanga. Yeah, and when yeah. they had that kicking yeah. machine. Different, oh, different world, eh? Oh, the, the World Cup in 2008, the jersey year, um, which we all signed to. Um, and that's probably one of my um, greatest moments that um, I enjoyed. Um, the competition over there was um, massive. It was probably the most teams that we had in the in the World Cup with um, the Pacific Islanders um, Island teams being there as well. Um, but it was the year two that um, Australia hosted, it, of course, and um, they were the, the favourites to win. They also had a um, you know, our coach um, come in that year as well, mm -hmm. coaching them. So the write-ups in the papers was for them to to be the favourites and um, on Suncorp Stadium um, we managed to thrash them 34-0 um, so you know that moment um, being out there and, and giving it back to the Aussies was the greatest moment in the early days we were still coming to coming to grips with the reality of women playing a contact sport being televised. Uh, there was always going to be their fair share of, um, of cynics, but there weren't too many. Uh, but the way that uh, women's sport has grown, and especially uh, the women's um, involvement in rugby league and the way that it televises, has seen it become a very, very popular television sport. Two dummies on the inside, and then the late ball for McGregor. And now they hit the right edge. The Kiwi fans, that's a great finish! Takarangi off a set play. Great job, Kiwi fans. Well, 2008, there was only one game at the Rugby League Women's World Cup shown, and that was just the final. In 2013, there were no games shown, and in 2017, we showed every game. So from a broadcast um, point of view, that was a real indication of how far the game has come as a sport and as a television product. We weren't comfortable with it. We weren't comfortable with the fact that we were three-time World Cup 
champs and we got a snippet in the paper um, or we got one article or we got um, a two minute segment on the news or after we'd won a World Cup, we just understood that that's right or wrong, that's just the way it was. It was frustrating in the early years, particularly given the quality of players involved getting information. Stars of yesteryear like uh, Trish Hina, Luis Ava Iki, Tessa and Summer Takahu, who were mainstays of the Kiwi Ferns in the bygone era. Um, it's a very different um, situation these days with uh, Apia Nichols, um, Honey Hidemi Smiler, the captain um, of the team, Crystal Rota, Georgia Hale, who are now household names, everything you need to know about the coverage of um, and background of uh, women's players is now readily available. The goat of women's rugby league, Honey Hidemi. The nickname Honeybill Williams, please. <laughs> yeah, it kind of just started as a joke. Um, back home, a reporter took a photo of me in the local Pataru, um newspaper. So I was, of all things, I was selling sausages at a community fundraiser um, in town and they asked us for our names and they took a photo of us selling sausages and I just, as a joke, said, oh, my name's Honey Bill Williams and they printed it. And so then my friends used to call me that, you know, like laugh about it. Um, I think when I reflect back on it now, um, at the time, you know, sort of coming through those years we, where there was lots of similarities between his career and mine with the rugby and the sevens and the, and the league and all of that kind of stuff. So um, if it was a way in promoting the game and, and I suppose myself in a sense, to promote the game, I didn't. I didn't care. I probably did care when they'd use the full Honey Bill Williams. You know, if it was just Honey Bill, fine. You know, whatever. That, that's just a, a small nickname. But if when it, they use the surnames, I wasn't comfortable with that because you know I, I have my own surname and it's it's my proud Fano name. So um, I'd get a little bit hung up on that. International Women's Rugby League from Hunter Stadium in Newcastle, the home of the Newcastle Knights in the NRL, but the home patch today for the Australian Gillaroos, who take on that team, the New Zealand Ferns, in this bitter trans-Tasman rivalry. With Aussie and the Kiwi Ferns, it's still that it's still that challenge. It's still that rivalry, that Traz Tasman rivalry that we like. What we like about the tests and what we like about the games is seeing if we can get the upper hand on each other. It's still, it's still there. It still exists. It's so real that I almost like grew up with this real vengeful thing whenever anything about Australia came up. Um, because it, you're right, like they were our biggest rivals, and I think for many years we they. They really did fear us and we knew that and we weren't cocky about it but we were confident about it um, and then obviously as, as the wheels have kind of turned and gone 180 on us I wouldn't say that we fear them but now there's a bit more of that mutual respect that we know that we've got some genuine competition here now and, and so the battles are so much more uh, when I came into the team in 2002 they were the world champs and we held that standard for so many years, like that's what we played for, was to continue to be the world leaders, to be the world champs, to definitely beat Australia uh, was always a, a big driving motivation. Yeah, I, st I still think we're better. I believe that we really did punch above our weight. Um, we haven't historically had big size in our games, uh, in our teams, sorry. Um, you know, a lot of the girls, they may appear that they're big from the TV, but they're actually, we, we haven't had a lot of very um, heavy girls, so we definitely are a little bit more physical in our play, and I suppose that's probably, I don't, I don't know if it's kind of a little bit of a Kiwi trait, but it seems to be similar to the men as well, is that we're very physical in the game and hit hard. A couple of minor injuries, perhaps the kick was down the throat of Bremner, and goodness me, the collision was extreme. Georgia Hale puts a shot on the Australian fullback. Do you know our culture was actually the one thing that was, that you know, when you look at point of difference, that was kind of like our, you know, our superpower in our team. It was like, you know, because of our culture, we had that extra, that extra element to our team that we could bring into our team, into our games, because um, 
because even though we had Māori, Pacifica, all different, you know, Tongans, Samoans, um, Cook Islanders, um, we just had that shared values based um, approach to everything. But when we'd go on tour, we'd be like, there's, there's things about our team that the Jullaroos will never understand because they don't have it. And, um, you know, they, they can try to put their finger on and say, what is it about them? Why do they keep it? But, you know, and they're one of the things. So it's so important that um, that we hold on to, to that as, as part of our um, as part of our makeup as the Kiwi Ferns because that's that's really who we are like even as a country. That feeling is like um, it's almost like something comes over you. As a Māori for me doing the haka is, is about grounding and, and connecting with my tūpuna, my ancestors, welcoming them, welcoming them in um, as I lay out the challenge, you know, in front of a, a team like Australia. I think what gets me during that haka is I like to, you know, stare them down, eyeball them, and when I see the smirks on their face, man, that just like, you know, just like, you wait till we kick off, you know. <laughs> There was some question as to whether we should do a haka and uh, we got advice on that and obviously um, it's a very special thing. There's nothing like um, getting out there and, and doing a haka because it's, I think, it's a really proud moment because it's something unique to New Zealand and when you're representing your country, which is an honour in itself, to be able to do something quite unique um, compared to the other nations, it, you know, it's very special. I even remember one year um, when the Māoris didn't want to lead the haka and the Māori girls were like, oh no, nah, I'm too shy, I don't want to lead the haka. And we're like, you have to lead the haka. And then one of our Samoan girls, one of my really good friends, Ina, um, she ended up leading the haka, you know? So that's cool. As a Samoan, that wasn't unfamiliar. The Māoris were like, oh yeah, Ina lead it. You know, it's not something that just belonged to them, to the Māoris, it belonged to all of us as part of this team. It's like that, that one less, uh, one, one last preparation thing that I need to do before we kick off and actually get into playing. So, um, yeah, the feeling of the haka, Sometimes it just overtakes you, you know, and it can because, you know, sometimes I, I like straight away when I'm finished the haka, I need a water, like I need to like, holy heck, you know, <laughs> is there, there's half my, half my energy gone kind of thing. So uh, the, the haka is so powerful. Been there 20 odd years, time to go. And I was so thrilled that when New Zealand Rugby League said, well, look, we'll pick it up. We'll help the girls. I was so pleased for that. Really, really thrilled when they did that because, hey, what have you got today? I think that was a great decision and all due respect to the committee and all those that have been there previously with the New Zealand Women's Rugby League because they did an absolutely amazing job um, with very little resource and bringing the um, team under the New Zealand Rugby League, what that has allowed us to do is to build a little bit more credibility, more opportunity, and of course, um, work towards equality. It's exciting, um, and as I say, I think it's more about more opportunity and more opportunity for women, not just playing the game, but also in all areas of the game, in coaching, management, training, refereeing, and um, it's, it's allowed us to build all support mechanisms and um, opportunities around the women's game. And I hope this continues for many, many years to come and I hope this also brings a lot more women to rugby league because I tell you, it's a beautiful game. So a lot to enthuse about the future for Oceania Rugby League at the elite level. We've really put women's rugby league um, on the map in terms of the game. Um, right around the world um, and we still probably hold that benchmark. I think when you're in the environment you're very much educated on the history of it so you're aware of it and as of recent now that other people are starting to learn and, and know who the Kiwi friends are 
it's also giving us an opportunity like this to be able to tell that history because it, it's rich history, it's a legacy and if it wasn't for those players that played in those 95, you know, through to, you know, all these years really, who put their, you know, their families and sacrifices and all of that on the line, we wouldn't be where we are today. So it's always about acknowledging that. But I couldn't have done it without the great support and the help, you know, of my committee. They were great, they were great. And they were just, we were all volunteers. Nobody got paid for doing this job. We may have been lucky and got uh, a seat to go away on a trip and got to sleep in a, in a nice um, motel in Australia, but hey, we earned it, I think. But it was all about our Kiwi ferns. So you when you look at all of them, there's been hundreds of them. And now they're mummies, they're probably grandmothers. Oh, I don't know, but you know, the story's awesome. Having the opportunity to yeah, to bring the game out into the open and and have it, you know, people see that women can play rugby league and that we are good at the game is makes me really proud that I was part of that um, and that hopefully that helps contribute to the future of the game as well. Even now we're proud when we see the girls go out with the jersey, we're proud when we hear that there are changes for the women that are coming, um, that now they have an NRL competition, another elite competition that they can be a part of. That makes us proud, like we're, we're not in it, but it makes us proud to know that we held those standards and we did all of that because we wanted the future of, the, of Women's Rugby League to continue. We celebrate on that. The old girls are like, yes, you know. Um, we hurt when, you know, we might have a loss. We feel it because we're, we're, same, we're, same, we're part of the same family, the Kiwi Friends family.